You think? <clears throat> okay. You got to say it loud. I mean, you're the only two. How many books are in the New Testament? Twenty-seven. How many books are in the Old Testament? Thirty-nine. How many books are in the whole Bible? About. Hey, that got everybody quiet. <laughs> About how many men? About how many men wrote the Bible? About forty. How many years did it take to write the Bible? About sixteen hundred. Sixteen hundred years. About sixteen hundred. Okay. Uh, let's sing the books of the Bible. Ready? Let's start with the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Job, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Zechariah, Zephaniah, Haggah, Zechariah, Malachi. I sing the New Testament. A little quieter. Ready? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts and letter to the Romans. First and Second Corinthians. Galatians and Ephesians. Philippians, Colossians. First and Second Thessalonians. First and Second Timothy. Titus and Philemon, Hebrews, James, first and second Peter, first and second and third John, Jude and Revelation. I say creation. Genesis one. Genesis six and seven. The flood. Easy. Genesis nineteen. Sodom and Gomorrah. Where's your paper? You would know these. Oh. Genesis 37. Joseph sold by his brothers. Genesis 37. Genesis 37. I got gotcha. you. Exodus 7 through 12. The plagues. Exodus 20. The Ten Commandments. 1 Samuel 1. Hannah. 1 Samuel 17. No, First Samuel 17. David fights Goliath. Second Kings 5. No, name is leprosy. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. There you go. Matthew 6. Model prayers. Matthew 10. Twelve of them. The twelve apostles. Matthew fourteen. Death of John the Baptist. Matthew nineteen. No marriage and divorce. Matthew twenty three. Proper place of preachers. I need to work on these apparently. Matthew 25, Judgment Day. Matthew 27, there you go. Uh, let's stop there. Um, what is the definition of true success? What's the definition of true failure? What's God's ideal for marriage? And when we grow up, we're going to marry a... Okay, walk by... hear that? <laughs> Hope everybody had a good day today. I'm not Wyatt, but so don't expect me to juggle or solve a Rub Rubik's Cube. Our first song will be number 123. 
the steadfast love of the Lord. <clears throat> 123. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will in him. Therefore I will walk in him. The song before the opening prayer will be number 288. <clears throat> 288. All three verses. There Jesus, ruler of all nature, O Son of God and man, the Son, He will I change. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and this beautiful weekend you bless us with. We thank you for the ability to come back here this evening and and learn your word, Lord. We we pray that we open up our hearts and ears to to listen to your word and, and to study it and to implement it into our daily lives. Lord, we thank you for everything you've given us and the blessings we have and until next time in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You want to mark number 957, 957, if you're using the book.
their invitation song. The song before the lesson will be number 450. Give me the Bible. 450. We'll sing all the verses. <clears throat> Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wonder, lone and tempest-tossed. No storm can hide that radiant, peaceful beaming since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible when my heart is broken, when sin and grief have filled my soul with fear. Give me the precious words by Jesus spoken. Hold a faith lamp to show my Savior near. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, lamp of life immortal, hold up that splendor by the open grave. Show me the light from heaven shining portal. Show me the glory gild in Jordan's way. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Good evening. We're glad you're here this evening. It's so good to be together once again tonight. Maybe some of you, because of the jail being canceled today, had a chance for a nap. Anybody get a nap? All right, good. Good. So y'all be rested up because we're going to deal with a mystery. And we started a series on the mystery of godliness. And tonight's schedule was the youth night. But we're going to postpone that because we're missing some greed. I don't want to say gears, but greers. But they make the gears work for what we're going to be doing next Sunday night, Lord willing. I want to encourage all the young people to be here because you're going to get a free gift, number one. I think you're really going to like it. Number two, you're going to learn something. And number three, you're going to see something you probably have never seen before. And so let me encourage you to be here next Sunday night. And we're glad, to, however, you're here tonight, and hopefully this won't be too much of a letdown because people love mysteries. One of my favorite reads and watches, mysteries, especially Sherlock Holmes. I really like reading how he solves the mystery by observing details. Well, in Scripture, we have mysteries revealed, and because of how the inspiration was given to the writers, he gives us specific details that helps us to solve or understand those mysteries. 
And I think you'll see that unfold tonight as we look at this mystery, because actually the lesson is entitled, The Mystery of the Broken Branches. Do I have your attention? The Mystery of the Broken Branches. If you would, please turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 11, and we're going to start there with verse 16 in this study tonight. In reference to these broken branches. Now the text is, is going to center around what we read in verse 25 of Romans chapter 11. And note that he writes there, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Have you ever been put in a spot that you felt like, I just don't really know and I should know? I guess t Kyle, it's time for confession. Is that okay? The kids up here are just hollering out with, all kinds of enthusiasms, and I was just feeding on that enthusiasm that they were ex expounding. But, but what was amazing is he would ask those questions, and it'd be like that. They'd, they'd pop an answer off. Well, each time they popped the answer off, I was still thinking. Now, I know they're a lot younger than I am, and they can respond much quicker, but they responded with right answers that I did not know. And I'm thinking, I need to study like they've been studying those those little sheets that y'all see in the back of your uh, pews there. I, I started, actually pulled that out and started looking for the right answers, but by the time they got done with them, I was, it was too late. And so I appreciate these young men who have, have worked hard to have those answers just like that. And if you think about it, mystery was solved rather quickly with that information that they shouted out. And they got most of them right. That's what's even more amazing. But it's clear they were not ignorant of some of the things I was ignorant of. And Paul, in writing this book to the Romans, did not want those brethren ignorant regarding, as he will call it here, this mystery. He identifies the specifics. This mystery. And what he's going to do, he's going to reveal to them a mystery. And it's the mystery of the broken branches. And first of all, what he tells us is that those broken branches lose the nourishment of the roots when they're broken free from the tree. And of course, as you look at this discussion, he's talking about the olive tree, particularly the, a wild olive tree in reference to what we will call the Gentiles or what Scripture calls the Gentiles, the better way to put it. Look at verse 17. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree, and he's applying that to Gentiles, and you might want to remember that, you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partner of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. So there is an olive tree under discussion, and then there's a wild olive tree. Now how many of you would pretty much suspect that the place you need to be is not where the wild olives are, but where the olives tree that's being cultured and cultivated is at. Well, we get that, don't we? Just like the difference between wild blackberries and, and, and tame blackberries, and probably a better illustration is wild strawberries versus the strawberry plants that we plant. And I see those little wild strawberries out in the yard around the fence, and I'm thinking, why don't the Creatures eat that, but they don't. Why do they eat the tame ones? Well, I don't know the answer to that necessarily either. But what I do know is that we have a contrast here from the wild olive tree to the olive tree. And he's been talking about those branches. When they're broke off, they lose access to the nourishment that is supplied by the roots. So I want you to look at this picture here. This is a, a picture taken in Palestine. And what has happened here is that Someone on purpose has went through not to remove the branches for a reason, not to prune the tree, but to destroy it, to make it unusable. And this is because of the war that was going on over there. And of course, this lady, she's in mourning at the loss of her olive trees because they are an essential part of their life. And she knows because those branches have lost access to the roots that they're going to be cut off. Now, as you look at verse 18, he goes on and he says, Do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, and he's talking to the Roman Christians who were Gentiles at this point, 
But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. So they had no right to think better of themselves than God would think of them because they were not nourishing the root. Rather, the root was nourishing and supporting them so that they could live and prosper and bear fruit. And sometimes that's important to understand because ultimately we know the symbolism here. He's talking about their relationship to the root being, of course, God and feeding off what God supplies, and that came through Jesus Christ. As Isaiah 53, verse 2 speaks in prophecy of Jesus, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. Now, I think it's fascinating that this passage speaks of root out of dry ground. How many of you have noticed that occurring? Maybe you're out in the desert, maybe it's a home in your garden and it hasn't rained for a while, but all of a sudden a plant will still come up. Now how is that possible? How can you have this plant growing, as you see here in this slide, how can a plant grow out of ground like that? It's because the roots go where? To where the water and the nutrients are in the soils in order to supply the growth of the plant and they say all across the desert you have that very same thing occurring the roots are feeding plants so you look at how can they grow in that sand how can they grow in the heat how can they grow in such dry ground the secret is the root out of dry ground provides that source of life as colossians paul writes there to the brethren he says as you therefore have received christ jesus the lord so walk in him notice that relationship walking in him rooted and built up in him what's the value of the root the root is that which supplies what is necessary for the branch to grow rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught abounding in it with thanksgiving i'm amazed that you can take a plant and never put any water on the outside of the dirt right terry but you can water the roots and the plant flourishes. That's the way we live as Christians. We're nourished not by that which is external, but we're nourished by that which is internal. And it's a source of life for you and I because outside we're destined to die. It's like we've been cut off. And speaking of being cut off, look at verse 17 again. And if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. So they were from the wild olive. They're engrafted into the actual olive tree where they're fed what is necessary for them to grow and to prosper. And so they have life. And the only reason they have life is because of what we read here. Broken branches make a place for grafting in new branches. That's kind of significant to think about, isn't it? Broken branches make a place for grafting in new branches. That's exactly true. And of course, that's what Paul wanted these brethren who were Gentiles to understand with reference to the Jews who cut, were cut off. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But uh, there's something rather significant about this. This is actually olive trees that have had branches grafted in. You see the, the branches are, are broken off. And this is actually what they did when, when because of the destruction of the war and they came through and they destroyed the olive branches off those trees. That didn't mean it was all over. It meant a lot of work if, they were going to, if that tree was not going to die. Because what they would do is they would take and graft in just like they're doing here. And it would supply life, not just to one, but to several branches. And that is significant because that's the concept of what the Apostle Paul is writing about to these brethren being Gentiles. That they came from the wild olive tree, but they were grafted in because of opportunity due to the broken branches that he will reference to the Jews who were cut off, and he'll tell us why here in a little bit. 
but they were able to become partakers of that root and thus feed themselves. Verse 18, he says, Do not boast against the branches. You know, they can't point the finger and say, ha-ha, you were cut off. Look at this. Thank you. We've got a fine place to rest here and feed and nourish ourselves. He said, don't boast. But if you do boast, here's what is significant. Remember that you do not support the root. You see, when the Gentiles, by the grace of Almighty God, were engrafted into the olive tree, was not on their own merit. It was by the grace of an almighty God that the gospel went to the Gentiles. He goes on, verse 19, you will say then branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, that's well said. In other words, without the foundation of the Jews, they would have not had opportunity because it was through the Jews that the Messiah would come. In other words, that was the only way there would be that nourishment there for them, would be in Christ. Well, we might be asking ourselves, why were they broken off? And this is our third point. The reason the branches were both broken off. Why? Verse 20. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. Now think about that. The Jews were those that had the benefit of the law. The Jews were those who had the history with God. The Jews were those, those who knew about the, all the miracles that happened in Egypt. They were the ones who had the connection to the knowledge of how the world was created. They understood things that others did not know or had forgotten or chose to forget. They were the ones that had the benefits of Solomon's wisdom. They were the ones who had the knowledge of sin because of the law. They were, had the prophets. So they were the ones who should have stood as stalwarts of belief. They should have been the monuments of belief. But here comes Jesus to a time where he walked among those Jews. And what do we see? They were divided with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, even the scribes. For Jesus called them hypocrites. Because they were the ones who should have been the people of belief and faith. But no, no. The majority was not. They rejected Jesus as the Messiah. They were among those who cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Yet they should have been the ones that understood Jesus was the Messiah. They shouldn't have ignored the miracles that Jesus did. But they were broken off. Why? Was it God's fault? No, it was because of their unbelief. And folks, if you want to see it, a visual of the Jewish nation, look at this. They were broken off. And what's going to happen to those limbs? They're not grafted back in. They're going to die. And there's only a certain window of time those people had. Because, see, death would come to them. And unless they were grafted back in, they had no hope. But also, there was something else coming. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. There was going to be a destruction that they would face. But I want you to notice this. This is an illustration that someone came up with, and I didn't draw this up, but it kind of gives you an idea of what Romans 11 is talking about and what we've been trying to express in this study. Number one, you have the Gentiles who are from the wild olive tree. They're, they were rooted in, in the pagan world, if you can view it that way, and they were part of that wild olive tree. They're not connected to the roots supplied by God. However, they, through the work of Christ as Gentiles, those wild branches, if they were believing and obeyed the gospel, they were grafted in to the true olive tree. And so also were the natural branches. As we know, on Pentecost, 3,000, then 5,000, 
then more and more many Jews did obey the gospel. But in comparison to the, the number of Jews throughout Jerusalem and Judea and Canaan area, that was a small group. And here's the tragic part. The unbelieving Jews, who were the natural branches, were cut off. Why? Because they separated themselves from Christ. And they wouldn't accept the fact that when Jesus died on that cross, he took the law that they cherished so much, and what did he do with it? Colossians 2, verse 14. It was blotted out by Jesus. It was nailed to the cross. But they wanted to cling to that law which gave them no longer hope. They wanted to cling to that law that was no longer in force because Jesus established the new covenant. And so therefore they were cast aside. They were these branches. And notice what Romans eleven twenty one says. For if God did not spare the natural branches, the words go to the Gentiles, he may not spare you either. In other words, if they walked away from the truth and the faith, they would be cut off just like those unbelieving Jews. So a warning is given. And that's why in verse 22, there's a therefore. Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity on those who fail. Severity. But towards you, goodness. So what happened? What happened when those Jews refused to obey the gospel? What happened when those Jews stood up against the preaching of the gospel? What did they do? They sealed their own faith in that unbelief. And what is that? They were facing the severity of God. And with that, he reminds those Gentiles, he says, if you continue in his goodness, you'll enjoy that goodness. And that goodness was expressed to the Gentiles when the gospel was preached to the Gentiles. And they had opportunity to obey the gospel by the grace and the mercy of God. But he warns them, if you continue in his goodness. Can you imagine after reading this that someone would teach once saved, always saved as a doctrine? Is that what we're reading? Once the Gentiles were grafted into the tree from the wild tree, did that mean they can never be cut off? Is that what we're reading? Some of y'all are going, no, it's not. It's not what we're reading. They had a responsibility to continue in His goodness. And whether or not they did was their choices. And He makes it clear, otherwise you also will be cut off. I feel sorry for somebody who would live their life out after once naming Christ and live it being cut off from Christ. The condition is, if you continue His goodness, what's the result? If you don't, there's the severity. And that's a lesson or two or three or four on its own. But I want to go back to Romans 11, verse 23. It goes on, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. You see, those Jews, even though they rejected Christ at Pentecost, or rejected Him previous to that, there still existed, as long as they drew a breath, the opportunity to be grafted in. And that's the beauty of the gospel, isn't it? If a person, no matter at what point in life, makes up their mind in faith to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's hope. And that's what Paul is trying to get across to these Gentiles. Even though they were cast off, there's still hope. There's still some life there where they can be grafted in. But their time is limited because of death, some other relative factors. But the 
it is clear, no matter how bad a person sins, no matter what they've done, if they're willing to repent from that sin, seek obedience as described in the Scriptures, they can be grafted in. And that's the wonderful news of the Gospel. That is the center of good news. Times of ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men to repent and gives them that opportunity to do so while they live. And so God is able to graft them in. For if, verse 24, you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Those that were once part of that tree, cut off, have opportunity to be grafted in, both Jew and Gentile. But unfortunately, there's too many that are ignorant of this mystery. What is that mystery? That they can be grafted in. And look at what the problem is. Lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Yes, the Jews were blind. They could not see that Christ was the Messiah. They could not see that those disciples, those apostles were preaching the gospel. And as Jesus would declare when he interacted with them during his public ministry, they are blind leaders of the blind. And what happens if the blind leads the blind? Both will fall into the ditch. They would continue, if they were blind, not only to themselves walk outside of the root, but they also would lead others on the outside so that they would not continue in the branches. But here is what's so significant about the mystery. There is hope for deliverance and salvation. As Romans 11 verse 26 declares, And so all Israel will be saved as is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away in godliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now some people have misunderstood this passage. Notice it says, so all Israel will be saved. Some have made this to say that that's what God's going to do no matter what a Jew does in his life. Folks, Scripture does not teach that. It's not what it's teaching at all. It's teaching about the hope of deliverance. And where is that deliverance found? In doing what the gospel teaches. And the only way any Jew could find a place in Christ was in being obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that is a part of the covenant that he promised them. And there's another aspect to this. The Jew's life was going to be cut off. For some it would be death. They'd be cut off. But of course, it started with the cross. Christ nailed the law to the cross. People became accountable to the new covenant. Only those who obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ found a place grafted to the olive tree. But unfortunately for the Jews, many of them would not come to repentance. And he would find death. And many found destruction. The physical destruction of the Jewish nation in A.D. 70. When Titus went against that city and destroyed it. What happened to the Jewish nation? That was the ultimate of being cut off. No longer could they sacrifice sacrifices in the temple to the point that they lost the lineage. They were cut off as a nation. Essentially, no longer could they function like they did under the old law. That was why it was important that the gospel be preached to them, that they become engrafted back into the tree that they were separated from. And look at what Paul writes in Romans chapter 4, verse 13, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. No, not through the law was the real promise. The promise was given to Abraham and to his seed. Who would become the seed of Abraham? Who would 
find their source of nourishment and life in the root of Jesse. We know, don't we? In Christ. But what's that about? Not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith that came through Christ. And look at what Paul told the Galatians. And Clayton, you pointed this out this morning. For you're all sons of God, both Jew and Gentile. You're all sons of God. You, Jew and Gentile, are grafted me in when? What? For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have what? Put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Why not? Because they're all branches in Christ. Neither slave nor free. Why not? They're all branches in Christ. Neither male nor female. Why not? They're all branches in Christ. That you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Who are we? Remember the Wizard of Oz? He had the tin man and he had the scarecrow and the lion. Interesting characters. But who were they? They were not real. And you remember when they were in the forest among the branches and the trees that moved around? Think about Christ. Those Jew and Gentiles found that in Christ there was true life, true nourishment that would give them the hope of understanding the full, complete, ultimate goodness of God, not His severity. Where do you want to be? In Christ or outside? Well, I know the answer comes to my life. I want in. I want to be one who is nourishing myself, being rooted to Jesus. What about you? Tonight we're going to stand, we're going to sing an invitation song. The plan is laid out here on the screen. Easy to understand. You probably know where you're at, whether or not you've taken the step. But heaven is a choice. The Jews had the choice. To be grafted in, the Gentiles have the choice to be grafted in, and that's the beauty of the mystery. But if they made the right choice, they can enjoy the goodness, not the severity. So this, tonight, as we stand and sing this song of invitation, we beg you to let us help you. Make sure you're planted properly, being rooted and grounded in Christ through being grafted in. Tonight, if you have a need, why not come?
saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? Angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be let home in this world anymore. Please be seated. May I see the hands of those I'd like to be served the Lord's Supper? Let's pray. Father God, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, we ask that you help us to clear our minds of any worldly care and just focus our thoughts on the great sacrifice that you and your Son made at Calvary for us. Father, knowing the great price that was paid for our sin debt and the hope that we have, we ask that you help us to live a life that serves, serves your kingdom and a life that will be acceptable to you. Father, as we prepare to take this bread, which represents Christ's body, we ask that we do so in a manner that is pleasing unto thee. We pray these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Almighty and Holy Father God, again we come to you to thank you for our Lord and Savior. We thank you, Father, for sending your Son and for his willingness to leave his glory in heaven to come down to this earth to live a perfect life and lay that life down at the cross for us. Fathers, we prepare to take this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's blood in the new covenant. We ask that we do so in a manner that's acceptable to thee. We pray these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Is there anyone who is in need of the offering plate this evening? Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your love. We thank you, Father, for all of our blessings. We know, Father God, that every good thing in our life flows down from your heavenly lights. We thank you, Father, for the means and abilities that we have to earn a living. We thank you that we live in such a blessed nation, Father. We thank you for all that we have and all that we are. As we prepare to give back a portion of our blessings unto you, Father, we ask that you help us to do so with a happy heart. We ask that your kingdom may be glorified. We pray these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Okay, we just have a few announcements here. Um, we want to remember that on June 1st, there's a senior planning meeting, 6 o'clock here at the building, bring finger foods. Um, next Sunday is the fellowship dinner. It will be held in the new building. It will be corn dogs and barbecue. Uh, but please bring side dishes for that. And then also June 4th, there's a VBS meeting following the evening worship, and that will also be our youth focus. So, kids, make sure that you're here. Um, also, tonight, after right after service here, we're going to have ice cream sandwiches for the kids. There's not an age limit on kids, so if you want an ice cream sandwich, come out there. We're going to have it over here by the preacher's house so they can play a little bit too. And if anybody's interested in kids or grandkids going to Bible camps, Get with me, please. Um, that is fast approaching. I know the first one is the second week of June down here at Happy Hollow. So, and my kids will be attending that one. We've got a few prayer requests. First, let's announce this one. Though the wedding of Andrew and Michaela will be June 10th at two o'clock here at the building. So let's make plans to be here and support them. And also, okay, prayer requests we have are um, prayer for Alan Bright, which is Rick's brother. He'll be having a double knee replacement on Tuesday. This is more than complicated. This is more complicated than usual because Alan has heart condition. So let's keep that family in our prayer. And also, uh, Randy Cameron, cousin of Jamie Solis, has kidney and liver failure and is not expected to pull through. So let's keep that family in our prayer as well. Uh, Bob just handed me this and says, Please pray for Fernando. He's having surgery on 531. Uh, this congregation supports him. And also, um, Angela and Kent Henderson, they come here sometimes. Um, they lost a two-year-old nephew this past week, uh, he lost his battle to leukemia. So we need to remember the Henderson family. Um, that service for th that baby will be next Saturday. So we should remember to keep that family in our prayers as um, they navigate life from here on out. And that's all I've got if I didn't miss anything. Closing hymn will be number 587. 587, we'll sing the first and last verses. Those who are willing and able, please stand for it. Remain standing for the prayer. Glad to see all the visitors. Welcome you back. <coughs> 
If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend. Trust in his promises, grand. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal. Trust him who leads you, he will keep your soul. Let all be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Off we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth crown and pass us by, there are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope Trust him each day, we shall have pleasures untold. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal. Trust him who leads you, he will keep your soul. Let all be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice, praise him in song, sing and be happy today. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we have to come together and study your word. Father, we ask you to be with those that are on our sick list, and we ask you to be with the uh, Henderson family as they are going through a rough time, Lord, and with the loss of a, a nephew and a son and a grandson. We just ask you to be with that family and lift them up in the only way that you can. Father, we ask you to be with uh, Randy Cameron and that family as they are also preparing themselves if the worst must come, Lord, that, that, and ask you to put your hand over them and, and guide them in these uncertain times. Father, we ask you to be with Rick's brother, um, as he goes, prepares for surgery, that it will be successful and there will be no complications and that he will be able to pull through and, and have a speedy recovery. Father, we ask you to be with Fernando as he is preparing for surgery as well, Lord, and we just ask you to, to guide the surgeons and watch over them and that whatever he's having done will be done quickly and he will have a quick healing process. Father, we just ask you to be with us as we prepare to leave this place and that you bring us back at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.